As you know, Pastor Travis has been ministering on extending grace, I think the last uh, two, if not three <clears throat> uh, Sundays. And so I just kind of felt to carry on from there. We talk about being ambassadors of grace or extending grace. So I guess this is going to be part three or part four. And, um, you know, I got thinking about, you know, extending grace. You know, you can only give what you have, right? If, if you need $100 and I don't have $100, I can't give you $100. If I have $50, then somehow I've got to find another 50 for you. And grace is like that. Sometimes it's not that you don't have any grace. Sometimes maybe you don't have enough for the situation, right? Amen. And so there was a gentleman... Um, Back in 1957, his name was Jim Elliott. And I don't know, Candy, did you get a chance to find a picture of him? And uh, in 1957, uh, this gentleman, Jim, uh, he, he was very passionate for the Lord. And he just, his heart was just to see people uh, come to Christ. And he wanted to, to reach out. And so he uh, did a missions trip um, down into Ecuador. <clears throat> And actually, there was a number of years of training coming up to all, to all this thing. Anyways, he wanted to reach this people, and I'll try and say this right. It was a Horonii uh, tribe in Ecuador, or sometimes they've been referred to as the Akas. Uh, they were a very violent people. And in fact, the, the Shell Oil Company then, they had a, an oil well um, close to the territory that this tribe occupied. And they had killed some of their workers, and so the Shell Oil Company just pulled out um, and kind of abandoned that work because that's how violent they were. So anyways, these were the people that, um, that Jim Elliott and five other gentlemen that were with him, or maybe it was four others, so there's five altogether, they wanted to go in and reach these people. And so they would spend a lot of time preparing for it and going in. And what they would do is... They went in and they went with an airplane. One of the guys was a pilot, and he kind of flew in a circle, and he had this rope he let down. They had a bucket on this rope. We're talking 1957 here, so we didn't have te big technology, right? And so they would let stuff down to this tribe, and they would communicate with them that way, and <clears throat> it got to a point where eventually, you know, they would let sent down some gifts and things like that to them, and kind of just trying to build a relationship from a distance, if you will. And then at one point, they, this tribe, this, one of the members put something in the bucket and they lifted it up and it was a gift for them. So they kind of thought, wow, okay, you know, we've, we've got a relationship here, so we're gonna go in. <clears throat> and so uh, a couple of days after that, they went in and um, landed. They had, there was a big um, area on a beach where this pilot could land. And they went in there to make a long story short, they all got killed. The tribe turned on the spirit of every one of these men. And I think it was National Geographic eventually um, was part of the group that went in and helped to, you know, saw what, what went on and kind of pulled all these men and, <clears throat> and everything else. But um, something that Jim said, and he, he had a, if you ever get a chance to read the book, I think it's called uh, Through the Gates of Splendor. And I think they actually did a film on him as well it was called at the end of the spear or something like that um, <clears throat> but just a powerful story one of the things he said is he said he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose and you know his life was just such a, a testimony such an example of that anyways after this had went on um, all these men were killed within two years uh, Jim's wife, her name was Elizabeth, and his daughter, and one of the sisters of one of the other missionaries that was killed. In less than two years, they went in to live with this tribe, and um, they saw, like most of those people, come to Christ, and some of which were the men who had killed her own husband and, and these men. You know, how did these, how, how do they do this? How do, you, how do they extend grace in this situation? How can you and I extend grace? You know, in, 
And so I just want to look at some things here. Uh, you know, when we look in the scripture at this, <clears throat> it really came to me uh, about Hosea. And in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2, it said, in the beginning of the word of the Lord uh, by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, go and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Can we get the New King James on that? Sorry. So the first thing we want to take note of is that it said, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, you know, if you want the Lord to speak through you, then he has to first speak to you. You have to put yourself in a place. You have to position yourself in a place to hear from God. And in Hosea's life, you know, he became a, an example, really, of someone who extended grace. And in verse 2 and 3, we have here, um, says, when the Lord began to, okay, there we have it. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go and take for yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. And so I'll just leave it at that. But so at the word of the Lord, um, Hosea goes out and, and he walks this whole situation through because God is using him to bring a picture to a nation who was to be his own people, um, who were called to be his own people, but had departed from his ways. And um, because they were committing spiritual adultery, they were committing spiritual harlotry. And you know what? It's no different from you and I. If we depart from God, if we don't walk in his ways, then we're committing spiritual adultery. We're committing spiritual harlotry. And so Hosea was an example of God's grace being extended to this people. And so he goes and he takes, um, he goes and he, he takes himself a wife, and we see that she gives birth and has a son. And now to make the story short, she ends up having three children. So there's time where, here where Hosea, you know, he's, he's building relationship, he's building family. And then his wife, Gomer, she goes and runs after other lovers. And in the same way, it's true with us, right? That we can run after other things that are not what God has for us uh, in his plan, in his purpose. And in verse 8 and 9 here, the third son that is born to them, um, it says, Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. You know, there was, uh, I don't know if some of you may remember uh, Art and Carol that used to attend here, and uh, they ended up moving back Coburg Way. But I remember uh, Carol shared with me one time she was at a conference, and the Lord said to her, she said, uh, and it was some sort of a national conference or something, but the Lord spoke to her, and she said, Canada is low on me. She said, what? She said, Canada is low on me. And so she went, and she remembered that from, from Hosea, so she went and looked it up and realized it's saying that low on me means not my people. And she's saying, you know, that Canada is not my people. Now, I just want to add to that, um, three years ago, whenever the last federal election was, uh, there was a, there's a place called Long Island, it's still there, um, uh, just off of Nova Scotia, and there's this big archway on Long Island, or I should say there used to be an archway, and some, of the, some people used to refer to it as the eye. And I remember as a kid, uh, dad and mom took us down to the East Coast, we went at least once, maybe twice, I don't remember, but I remember going out around Long Island and walking through that 
eye and stuff. And it's in the Bay of Fundy, so the tides go up and down quite a bit there. And so there's times where you can walk through, and then other times you would have to have a boat or something. But anyways, the locals and, and some other people, they used to call it the eye. Um, and it wasn't necessarily always well known for that by, by many other people, but, but there was some reference to that because you could look out through this huge big archway out into the, to the sea. And anyways, on the night, on the very night that all the votes came in for a victory for Justin Trudeau, um, that archway collapsed. And I just felt like, you know, look, and I just read, it was just a day or two after that, I was reading about this archway collapsing that night. And I just felt like the Lord was saying, um, uh, out of uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15, I'm not sure I gave you that one, Candy. But in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13, um, where Matthew there is quoting Isaiah, and he says, the heart of this people has grown dull, and, and um, their eyes they have closed and their ears they have shut. And I just, you know, I just felt like, you know, that, that the thing that they refer to as the eye, that causeway, you know, collapsing, it was just kind of another indication again of, you know, Canada is not my people. But my, this is the encouragement in verse uh, 10, Hosea, the Lord goes on in Hosea. Sorry, can you kind of jumping around here on you? But. Uh, <clears throat> it says, The children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. Amen? It, it, in all the dismal of, of looking and, and the struggle that we have, even in our own country of Canada, in the place where it's, being said that they are not my people it will be said that they are my people and and it's just awesome how God used Hosea to give an example of an extension of grace you know to a people who who didn't who didn't deserve that grace and you know we we all have to step back and 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 look at this uh, story of Hosea because it's so easy for us to look and say, oh, yeah, the Lord's telling Hosea, you know, go and get this wife and, and have children. And, and then he knows that she's going to depart and run after other lovers. And then <clears throat> he says to uh, Hosea again in chapter 3 and verse 1 to 3. Huh? Uh, New King James again. Yeah, just uh, I'll be New King James. Sorry. Yeah. And he says... Um, he says, then the Lord said to me, to Hosea, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who took other gods and love raisins and cakes and pagans. So I bought her for myself with 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. And so, too, will I be towards you. So, so at the word of the Lord, Hosea goes back to his wife who had run after other lovers. And, and he woos her back to himself. And, and he basically says to her, what I'm asking of you, you know, that you shall not help another man, I also will be towards you. And so the Lord is giving this whole thing of, of um, this extension of grace and how he, in the same way, is reaching out to the nation of Israel. And, uh, and I'll, I'll add to that, to the nation of Canada, and saying, even though you've gone after other lovers, even though you've gone after other things, I am here to, to draw you back again to myself. And it's easy for us to just say with Hosea, you know, and say that, um, you know, yeah, the Lord asked him to go and take this wife, and then she ran, then he asked her to go back again and love her again at, at the word of the Lord. Well, yes, he did that, but remember that Hosea was intimate with this woman. 
and this woman ran off with somebody else and was intimate with somebody else. And Hosea had to work through the emotional pain of doing what the Lord's asking him to do. Because sometimes we just, we stand back, we just look at the story, and we don't realize, we don't put ourselves in that person's shoes and realize all the stuff that he had to deal with so that this word could be written down for you and me to find encouragement, to find grace, to find hope in centuries down the road. You know, so God is just so awesome. He's so good. So here we have, you know, Hosea. And, and he's saying, it shall come to pass in the place where it was said, they are not my people. They should be called my people. And I believe God's going to have a people in this country. And, I, and he's got some of you here now. Amen. Who are called my people. And you know the example I gave about the archway in Nova Scotia collapsing and saying that, you know, the eye of this people has grown dull. You know, I believe the spirit of God, just when Jesus quoted Luke chapter 4 and 18, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight for the blind, amen, for those who've closed their eyes, you know, opening of the ears of the deaf. So there's always hope in the midst of these times when we, we face these times where people um, aren't looking, aren't desiring to pursue God. But coming back to, as I originally started out, you can't give what you don't have. So if you don't have grace to, to reach out, you know, to these people, how do we get it? And that's kind of the bulk of, of just kind of what I want to hit this morning. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16. Hebrews chapter 4. Okay. She's getting there. Um <clears throat> 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The first thing we have to do to receive grace, because I can't give it till I get it, is I have to go to the throne of grace. And it says, when I do that, that I will receive mercy and I'll find grace in time of need. And, you know, the difference between mercy and grace is mercy is not getting something you deserve. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. So mercy is not getting, for example, the judgment that you deserve, whereas grace is getting a, a goodness or a blessing that you don't deserve. And so we have to go to the throne of grace in order to get that so that we can have it to help in time of need. Maybe the need is for you, or maybe you're in a situation where the need is for somebody else. So the first thing we have to do is we have to go to the throne. We have, we have to receive it from God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access... by faith into this grace in which we stand. So the access to grace is by faith. So we go to the throne of grace to get it, but it comes by faith. We have to have faith. And there's three things I want us to look at here. Is that, first of all, to access this grace, we have to have faith. And there's a number of there's a number of elements um, in faith 
that the Lord kind of, you know, showed me uh, quite a number of years ago that I think are really important for us to take a look at because I have to have faith in order to extend grace because why would I extend grace unless I think it's going to make a difference in your life or my life? Why would I extend grace to you if I didn't think it was going to bring a result, if I didn't think it was going to bring a change to the situation? In Romans chapter 4, verse 19 and 21, we read here about the father of faith, Abraham. And it says here in verse 18, uh, it says, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed. Okay, so, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll start in 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. So God has come here, just to kind of fill you in on the context, he's come in and told Abraham that he's going to have a child. And Abraham's 100 years old. His wife is 90 years old. And so, but it says here that Abraham believed. And it's, there's elements here that, uh, that come out to what I'm going to call true faith. Because I think there can be maybe what we can term presumptuous faith. And we don't want that because we want, we want what's real. We want what's genuine. We want what's true. So true, true faith. First off, in verse 19, it says, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. He did not consider his own body. The, the NIV there says, Abraham faced the facts. I like that. I think true faith looks at my situation and it faces the facts. It looks at them for what they are. When it's saying here um, that Abraham did not consider his own body, it's not saying that he didn't face the facts. It's just saying he didn't make that his focus. That's, that was not what he meditated on all the time. And true faith, for, for all of us to move forward in, in true faith, is you, we have to face the facts, see what the situation is, but we don't meditate on the negative aspect of that. We don't meditate. We don't, we don't look at just the way it is now. So that's the first part of true faith, <clears throat> is you don't ignore the facts. You don't pretend, maybe you're sick, you don't pretend you're not sick. But at the same time, I don't focus on my sickness. And, I, and this is just me personally, I don't know how you handle it. And, and, uh, but if I have a cold or something like that, I don't say um, I have a sickness. I say I'm fighting a sickness. Okay, that, that's how I approach it. it. It's just like, I don't wanna own the thing right? But I want to I fight against it. And that's what we're trying to do in our faith is I'm not trying to hold on to the fact of the dismal situation that I'm facing, but I'm fighting against it. That's my first step in, in walking in true faith. The second thing is in verse 20 there, it says he did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief. So the next thing is, is not wavering at the promise of God. There's two things I find here. The first is, if you're going to grow in your faith, you have to know what the promises of God are. You have to familiarize yourself with the word of God. If you're going to know what are the, you have to be saying, what is the promises of God in my situation, right? Because we all face many different kinds of situations. So it's not just knowing one promise of God. You know, God has lots of promises for you and me for our lives. And so you have to know what are the promises of God. So we have to be a people that are in the word. We, you know, we have, to, we have to be students of the word if you want to be a person who's, who's growing stronger <clears throat> in your faith. So you have to know what the promises of God are. The second thing is, is not wavering at that promise. 
So it's one thing to know what the promises of God are, but the other is you don't want to waver. And basically what that means is not to have doubt-filled questions about those promises that God has. Um, in James chapter 1, verses uh, 2 to 8, I think we have that one, Candy. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into many temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally to all. She's changing the uh, thing on me. Who gives liberally to all. See, I was still on track. And who gives liberally to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he shall receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So all that to say that we don't want to waver at the promise of God. We don't want uh, to have doubt-filled questions. And I think the best way for me to to define this really is it's not about you can't question. See, there's a difference between having a question about something and having a doubt-filled question. And, and I liken this to uh, when Gabriel comes to Zechariah. So he comes to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 and verse 18. And... Luke 1 and 18, and Zacharias, you know, Gabriel appears to him and tells him that his wife is, is going to come and be with child. And Zacharias says, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And as we know, um, Gabriel ended up saying that, you know, you're going to be mute now, unable to speak until this child is born. Because his He's, the question he's asking, he says, how shall I know this? He didn't ask, how, how will this be? He asked, how shall I know this? How can I, in other words, how can I be sure of this? Right? He's got Gabriel standing right there in front of him, bringing a message from the Lord. You'd think that would bring some assurance, but anyways, it didn't. So his question is, is doubt-filled. But when we look at Mary in verse 34 and 38, Because Gabriel comes to Mary and says that she's going to have a child. And, she's, and she says to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? She doesn't say, you know, how, will I, how, shall, how can I know this? How can I be assured of this? She just says, how can this be? Like, it's, this has never happened before. And then in verse 38 is just her surrender. And she says to Gabriel, she says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word. So that's the difference between doubt-filled questions and questions where you're just asking, you know, I don't know, Lord. I don't know how this is going to work out, but I believe you can do it. Amen. The third thing, coming back to uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 and verse 20. Um, so we need to know the promises of God and, and not waver at those things, not be doubt-filled about it. Questions are good. Just don't be doubt-filled in, in, in your questions. At the end of verse 20, it says, Abraham, he says that he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. And, you know, giving glory to God, I'm just going to simply sum it up and saying, you know, he, he's giving God the praise. He's giving God the thanks for what he's saying is going to come to pass. And I like to kind of liken it to um, the 10 lepers. You know, there was 10 lepers one day on the road, and they're crying out to Jesus. And Jesus says to them, you know, go show yourself to the priests. And as they go, 
they're healed. And, but only one of them comes back to give thanks. Now, last summer, our kids went to VBS, and they always give them a CD that they can be listening to all the songs that they're learning that week. So this one song had in there this story about the 10 lepers, and the song said, um, I don't remember the whole thing, I'm not going to try to sing it for you, but it just talks about, you know, 10 men were changed. And I said to my boys, I said, guys, I said, 10 men were not changed. I said, and I, you know, this is me, right? I like these little doctrinal things. I like, I, I want to stick with the word, don't you? I said, 10 men were not changed. I said, 10 men were healed, but only one was changed because only one came back to give thanks. And so I just tried to encourage them. I said, when you sing that song, just slot in there, 10 men were healed, not 10 men were changed. So anyways, I hope they pick that up and carry that on. But so... Another element of having true faith, true um, faith is giving thanks. And probably you have too, and I have in my lifetime, have had lots of people say to me, I believe, I believe in God. You know, they don't go to church, they, they don't do anything, but they say, I believe in God. But my question is, are you giving him thanks? Are you giving him the credit for what's going on in your life? Because if you're not, then your faith's dead. Your belief in God is dead. And we can go back to James on that one, but we won't. So we want to give thanks to God. We want to give him the glory. And then finally, uh, the mark of true faith uh, in verse 21 is it says that Abraham was being fully convinced that what he was promised, he was also able to perform. First off here, um, you have to believe that God is going to keep his word. If God speaks something to you, if God has given you a promise, he is going to keep his word. He's not a liar. The second thing, and I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 19 and 26 here, where we're talking about God being able to do what he said. Jesus was saying to his disciples just previous to this about you know how some people just need to give up all of their money because um, he's saying you know about the rich it's difficult for the rich to be saved and his disciples say well then who can be saved right like everybody's got money and and so Jesus says he said to them uh, with men this is impossible but with God all things are possible a mark of true faith here is you know, Jesus didn't, it doesn't say here that uh, with men this is impossible, that for, for God all things are possible. It doesn't say that for God all things are possible. We know that for God all things are possible. But it says here that with God all things are possible. God is calling you and I into relationship with him. God is not trying to tell his story apart from you and me. He's calling us into relationship with you. He desires to show himself, you know, in you and through you. And that's why Jesus is saying, all things are possible with God. It's not just believing in the Christ. It's believing in the Christ in you the hope of glory. And that's what God, that's, that's the story God wants to write here. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is a powerful element in you and I walking in true faith. <clears throat> the next thing I want to look at here is extending grace also involves a shift or a change in your hope. When we read through um, in Romans chapter 5, we talked about how we have access to this grace that we want to extend through faith. And it goes on and it says that, you know, in this grace we, we, uh, <clears throat> that we stand, we rejoice in the hope of the glory. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, 
and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God is being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we see that there's this element of hope here. You know, again, why would I extend grace to somebody if I have no hope uh, of a future change in the situation? Romans chapter 4 and verse 18 going back to Abraham here, and we, we read verse 19 to 20 earlier, but it says of Abraham there, it said, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. Contrary to hope, in hope he believed. And what's happening here is, Abraham is going, because it sounds kind of funny, right? Contrary to hope, in hope he's, he, he believed. But what's happening here is he's shifting from a hope that's only after human reasoning, right? He's, we all have a hope. Um, well, maybe we all don't. But for those of us who want to have children, you know, you desire that somewhere down the road, you have this hope that you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, you're going to have this wonderful life. And, uh, and we do. I have a wonderful life. Praise God. Amen. But uh, we have this hope. But Abraham had this hope too. Abraham and Sarah had this hope. But now they're 190 years old. And so after human reasoning, another, and human reasoning is just looking at the natural situation. And when we look at the natural situation here, it looks like hope is pretty much done. Um, yeah, now you could continue to hope in that situation, but I would say it's probably a false hope at that point. So it says contrary to hope, in hope he believes. So he's shifting now from a hope that's based only, only in the natural realm to a hope that is coming in the, from the spiritual realm. It's coming from a promise that God has given him that he is going to have a son and he is going to become the father of many nations. So Abram, when it's saying that he hoped contrary to hope, or some of the, some scripture versions said that uh, in hope against hope, he believed. And that's really what happens is when you're going to move in a situation uh, that you're facing that's, that's difficult, whatever it is, it's a work situation or a relationship situation, you, you have to make this move from a natural hope to a hope that's birth of God. You have to abandon one in order to come into the other. And that's what Abraham had to do. The only way he was ever going to see this fulfilled was to shift, was to leave the natural hope, the natural way of looking at the circumstance that just how is this going to happen and believe God in his word it was going to happen. And this is so crucial for you and me. It's something that, you know, it can just happen like that, or, or we can just miss it like that, is that you, the only way you can get from here to there is you have to abandon one in order to come in to the other. Or you always be stumbling over that thing. You always be trying to push or trying to, to make your way in something that is not going to happen until you let go of that and let God and trust in God to bring that to pass. When the Spirit of God and the Word of God, which are in agreement, by the way, uh, regarding your situation you're facing is against the hope that you presently have, you have to let go. You have to make that shift. Now, none of us comes into this automatically. And that's why coming back here to Romans chapter 5, um, <clears throat> it says here that um, they glory in tribulations. He says not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. So there's a process here. And we all have to go 
through the process. There's no shortcuts. If you want to if you want to move in the hope, if you want to move in what God has for you, then we have to go through this process and this is how we receive this faith. This is how we come into this new hope that God has for us to be able to extend grace to others, to be able to to walk and live in that abundant life. Is you have to go through the trials. You have to go through the tribulations. And through that, you, get, you develop that patience, that perseverance, that long-suffering. And that works in you character. And out of that character is birthed this hope that you, you shift out of, you move out of this natural hope into a hope that is birthed of God, that is based upon the promises of God. You know, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19, it says, by which we draw near um, to God. There's There's a better hope, it says, by which we may draw near to God. You know, before they were trying to live by the law, but now there is a better hope through which we draw near to God. You and I, we, I hope, you want that better hope. And when you go back, Um, I think it's verse 16, it talks about this hope, it's founded on an endless life. It's founded on Jesus, who's the great high priest, and he remains in that priesthood after the order of Melchizedek forever because he rose again from the dead. His life is an endless life. He conquered sin. He conquered death. And our hope has to be founded on that. You know, in this life, um, we can all place our hope in many different things but that hope um you're gonna have to i mean that those kinds of hopes that are of this world are on a totally different foundation and at some point you have to abandon them in order to come into the hope that flows from god so part of the question is is your is this hope that you have, is it drawing you nearer to God? Because it says in verse 9, chapter 7 there of Hebrews in verse 19, you know, by which, this better hope by which we draw near to God. Is it drawing you near to God? Hebrews chapter 6 um, and verse 19 to 20, it just talks about, you know, that hope that has entered the presence behind the veil. It's the anchor for the soul you know we have this hope as an anchor for the soul is the hope that you have today is it is is it anchoring your soul or is it is it blowing you around is the hope that you have today is is it drawing you nearer to god if it's not then i would make the strong suggestion this morning that you want to shift out of that hope and get into the hope that is birthed by going through some of the hardships some of the trials some of the things that you have to get there that develops that character in you that empowers you, that enables you to take hold of that hope that's of God. And when you have that faith, when you have that hope, uh, then you can start extending this grace. Then you, you can be that ambassador for grace that God wants you to. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7. It's talking about, you know, this is the great chapter of love. And it says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. So this love, you know, and, and I just came to this a few months ago. The Lord just put that in my heart. You know, I just said, God, I want to hope the hope that love hopes. Because as we've already said, there's all kinds of different hopes out there based on other kinds of things but I want to love I want to hope the hope that love hopes and so that brings me to my last uh, point that I want to make here we've talked about faith having true faith we've talked about making a shift from a natural based hope to a hope that's based upon the promises of God uh, the spirit of God And lastly, in order to extend grace, you're going to have to love people. 
we have to love people. If I'm going to extend grace, I have to, I have to learn how to love the person that I'm extending grace to. Because love believes all things. You know, that's that faith. That's that true, genuine faith. Love hopes all things. You know, that's, that's that hope that is birthed out of love. And so we have to love people. And we have to be, if we're going to love people, then I have to be able to love myself. In other words, I have to accept myself for who I am right here, right now, where I'm at. Because you cannot have faith for other people. You can't have hope for other people. You can't love other people. If you can't accept yourself, how can you accept other people? How can we reach out to people? If I, if I, if I don't believe that God can take me and work in me and change me, how am I going to believe that for other people? 